In part one of this series, which I'll link here on the screen, I shaped this knife and went through the heat treat process. We just have, we've ground in some rough bevels and that's where we're going to pick up. Um, I'll get all the scale off of here. Looks like we've got a nice straight blade to work with. Um, and we'll continue with the bevels and then we'll go into finishing and of course the handle. When I work with a raw billet and I put it on my surface grinder, I usually go up to about 60 grit on that. So it's still pretty rough. So when I start hand sanding, I usually start at about 80 grit or 120. The surface grinder actually, even if you're going at a really heavy grit like that, like 60 grit, it tends to look a lot smoother. Um, as you can see here, I've just gotten the scale off of there and I found a little bit of a crack. This is bad news, but it's in a pretty good spot to have a crack. I wasn't really thrilled about that little divot that I have on the top of the profile there. Um, I think I kind of wanted that to be kind of a longer, more sweeping uh, gouge or whatever you want to call it. So for me, this is a pretty easy fix. I'm just going to take it to the grinder here and shave away past that point. And I didn't see any other cracks through the rest of this process. So we're in pretty good shape. I think that crack was really just because it was on the edge of the billet, which itself had some mild steel and some rough edges. So it was probably just remnants of, of the, uh, of the canister. Anyway, easy fix. And as you can see, I'm going into kind of a cross hatching pattern here with my, with my progression as I go through the grits on hand sanding. I kind of go back and forth on whether I like that technique or not versus just continuing the vertical. But in this case, um, I went with it and I think it's probably going to be my, my go-to norm from now on. It's really easy to see the previous grit sandpaper when you, when you go in a different direction. And that way I know when to go up to the next grit. I'm also just kind of getting the scale off of the swedge here and on the top and bottom edges of the blade. And once I clear off most of the muck, as you can see, now I'm getting into finishing these bevels. I've talked about these in previous videos, but these are from 3M. These are their Trizac belts or structured belts. And they work great for smoothing out the, the grind lines in your bevels. Really, if you were so inclined, you could skip the hand sanding process altogether because these will leave you with a pretty smooth finish along your bevels. And if you're working with Damascus, your patterns show out pretty well. Even if you are hand sanding, like I am in this case, I go up to a thousand grit on this blade because I really wanted that, that beautiful Damascus pattern to pop on this knife. But even if you are doing that, I still recommend these belts because it'll just get you that much closer to the end result you're looking for on your finish. And I dive back into hand sanding here. 
Right now I'm just bringing this up to 400 so I can put my electro etch on here. If you watched uh, my last video, you saw that I messed up the, the hot stamp trying to put my, be my benchmark on there. So I had to sand that down and, and uh, now I'll use the personalizer plus to, to put my benchmark on and it works really well. Uh, I'm just using a flat bar here and I'll alternate between the flat side of the blade and the, the bevel itself. And eventually I go into using a tongue depressor to get really into those tight spots like right into the plunge line there. And that's a really great tool for finished sanding. However, uh, if you're trying to maintain that really sharp distinction between the flat side of your blade and the bevel, like if you look right now, you can see there's a, there's a pretty sharp transition there. Uh, if you do use a tongue depressor because it's flexible, it will wash that, that sharp line out. So if you really are in love with that look, you want to stay with something rigid like a, like a piece of bar stock. Anyway, here I am putting my my benchmark on with the Personalizer Plus. I think in the future I'm going to switch from using electrical tape to block this off um, to using something else. I've seen other bladesmiths use like packaging tape with some success. Um, I've actually had some issues with the electrical tape, as you'll see here. If you look just south of that benchmark, there's a little bit of, of a, like a pock mark. And that's happened a few times, and I think it's the tape. I think it's just because it's so thick, it's allowing some of that um, the electrolyte fluid to get down into those crevices, and uh, sometimes it leaves those little marks. Marks. It's not usually a big deal because they're pretty thin, and I can usually sand right through them. But anyway, we just keep moving forward here, and like I said, eventually I go up to a thousand grit on this blade, and we get a pretty, pretty nice finish on it. And this is another thing I'm kind of notorious for, is heat treating my blade and then realizing I want to do some more file work or in this case I wanted to put a, a choil in here. And this is a hardened blade and it's really hard to get through. I eventually get what I'm looking for, but it's probably better to do that stuff before you heat treat and harden your blade. And like I mentioned, here I am using the tongue depressor. And this is just a really nice way to smooth everything out and get into those tight crevices. And for those of you who are maybe just getting started or interested in getting started in knife making, this process of hand sanding, depending on what kind of finish you're looking for, it can take days. I'm often out in the shop for hours at a time for several days to get this kind of result. So if you're going to go into something like this, prepare yourself mentally and uh, and be patient. You can't rush through the grits. You have to wait until you really sand out all the, the grind lines from the previous grit before you move up, or you're going to end up with a bad result. And those lines will show through, and you'll have to go back. And you don't want to go back. Um, and this is what it looks like when you take it out of the ferric chloride solution. I keep it in there for about seven or eight minutes to get this, this level of etch. I'm just using baking soda, which neutralizes the acid and keeps it from corroding further. That's essentially what etching is. You're putting it into an acid, which corrodes the steel, which darkens it. I'm really thrilled with the way this pattern turned out. I think this is one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful blade that I've ever made. I love the way it flows with the shape of the blade. I love that it's very bold. I just think it looks great. We'll take this over to the air compressor and blast it with some compressed air and that will help to set the pattern. It gives it a little bit more durable finish.
Before I put everything together, I like to just kind of wipe it down with some ultra fine steel wool. This just kind of buffs everything and makes it a little more uniform. You got some dark and light spots on there. I'll also take it over to the buffing wheel. I don't show that on camera, but I hit it with a clean wheel, no compound. And that just kind of just kind of gives it a nice uniform finish. It will be polished up and I'll take it to the buffing wheel again after the blades all put together. But you get you get an idea of where we're going with it. Here we have our handle materials. I'm using some stabilized cherry and a little piece of brass for the guard. Uh, I don't have it shown here, but I'm also using a piece of black micarta as a spacer between the guard and the cherry. And with my digital caliper, I've just got some measurements of the tang right where it meets the ricasso. Uh, we're going to make a little slot for the tang, but we want to make sure that that isn't any thicker than the thickness of the tang right at that point. You have to be very cautious as you, as you, as you cut that slot out. And you got to kind of creep up to that point because as soon as you go over, you'll leave a gap. So make sure when you start, I just start with two holes, that you use a drill bit that's no wider than the the end thickness that you're looking for in that slot. Once I get those holes drilled, I like to use this little Dremel cutoff wheel. It works really way, uh, well to get a good straight line between those two points. It's okay if I go a little bit past the holes uh, height-wise because the thickness of the blade actually is going to cover that up, but you can't go any thicker, of course. I'm just using these little diamond-coated Dremel bits, and I've got various diameters, and that's what I use to open up that slot a little bit until it's just wide enough for me to get my files in there. And then I use uh, a few different file sizes to make a nice, flat, straight hole.
there's a name for whatever this tool is. I just can't remember. And uh, this I just made from three jigsaw blades, which I welded to a piece of steel rod that I had, and I stuck a file handle at the end. I put a little bit of an angle on it just for ergonomics, and it works great. Only took me a few minutes to make it, and it's going to save me hours and hours. I wish I had done it a lot sooner. Um, I've used, you know, different methods using my drill press and hand drill and files, trying to, you know, work this cavity out without going too far over because you don't want a big expanse in there. When you're finishing and shaping your handle, you want that that hole for the tang to be as close to the shape and size of the tang as possible. Otherwise, you run the risk of, um, you know, sanding into it from the outside when you're finishing the blade or you're finishing the handle. As you can see, we've got a good tight fit here. No gaps between the brass guard and the blade and everything's ready to go for the glue up. Now that that has cured overnight, uh, it's time to shape the handle. I'm just using a handsaw here to lop off the excess. And then uh, we'll take it over the grinder really just to kind of get this down to a more manageable size. I don't really start shaping it until um, until I knock a lot of this bulk out of, out of the way. And then I'll use a variety of uh, attachments on the Dremel to start shaping it. And eventually just move into the, the the sandpaper and use my my hands to do it always being mindful of of where that tang is as i move along initially my focus here is is just on the guard and the spacer i want to get that to the size that i want before i move into hand sanding because even though brass is a lot softer than steel it's much harder than wood and if you just go right into the hand sanding with hand paper excuse me with sandpaper you'll see there'll be a little bit of a there'll be a distinction between the level of sanding you're able to get on brass and micarta than you will going into the wood depending on what kind of wood you're, you're using I'm using cherry which is a hardwood but it's still again softer than brass and micarta and I'm just using this little sanding drum to start shaping I'm going for a pretty basic shape here. I want a little bit of a swell in the back and in the front. I just want it to feel comfortable in my hand and not bulky. And we go all the way up to a thousand grit on this as well.
And I think the wood looks great here. This is after putting a little dark stain on it and some tongue oil to bring out the, the grain pattern. Unfortunately, I wasn't thrilled with the shape of it. So I, I felt like it was a little too big still. So I decided to start over at 240 grit and reshape it a bit. And I went through the whole process all over again. I didn't get this all on camera because I had already done it once and I figure you, you have a pretty good understanding of the process at this point. So just imagine uh, me doing that all over again, all the way back up to a thousand grit. I'm much happier with this shape. We're getting into the final stretches now. This is what the blade looks like before I put an edge on it. And after that, we just go for one more cleanup and final polish. And she's done. Well, this sucks. Um, this is really hard uh, to talk about because it, uh, it well, it's just very humbling because it showcases some of my faults as a bladesmith. Um, and it just, it just takes a toll on you when you put this kind of work into something only to have it fail. Uh, putting the edge on this blade um, normally is a pretty, it's a pretty simple process for me. It does take a lot of skill and practice. But um, once you, once you kind of get a feel for it, uh, for me anyway, this is usually pretty straightforward. However, um, I do sometimes run into an issue because I have, uh, I'm not sure if anyone's noticed, I'm missing a couple fingers on my right hand. And because of that, I don't have the same kind of comfort level when I go from one side to the other. Um, this knife is broken and it's, I broke it uh, because during the edge process uh, putting on the edge bevel I made some mistakes and uh, I ended up trying to chase that mistake trying to fix it uh, ended up going farther and farther up the profile of the blade to the point to where it started to get wavy and really just inconsistent it was hard to keep consistency because it was so wide you normally wouldn't have an edge that's you know, this is over an eighth of an inch wide here along the edge. Um, and that's because it, I, I wobbled as I was tracing it along the, the belt. And I, obviously the, you could, when, I, when I wobbled like that, you could see the wave in it and then I tried to fix it. And the only way to fix it was to go a little bit farther, you know, approach with a shallower and shallower angle, trying to chase down and, and smooth out those problems. So when I sharpen a blade, I, I, I sometimes use the flat platen like this and that's the best way to get a nice straight consistent angle all the way along the length of your edge um, however for me I feel more comfortable 
holding the knife like this and going this way. I like this angle and I like this the steadiness that I get when I switch to my left side, which is my less uh, my less comfortable side. I think it's just because I have less support with my right hand with the missing fingers. And when I do that, sometimes I get a little bit of a wave. Also, when I'm using, especially when I'm using these J-Flex belts, if I do this, there's a little bit of a soft spot on each side. So as you get close to the plunge line, sometimes you get a little bit of a, a drop off in that angle and it's noticeable. Um, this is something I've been gen generally been able to work through in my previous blades. And, um, and if I am having problem, a problem with this flexibility up here, I can switch back to flat pat platen and I can usually get a very good edge on this. I also have the option to go to a whetstone, um, which is probably what I should have done when I first encountered some issues here. But I didn't. I kept going and kept going to the point where I just got kind of frustrated with it and I decided to break it. I wouldn't say it was a full-on temper tantrum, but it kind of was. Um, for me, personally, when something gets beyond the point where I know I'm going to be satisfied with it and it's going to bug me for the rest of my life, I'd rather just uh, walk away from it. And it's easier for me to walk away from something when I don't have the option to come back to it. So for me, putting this in the vise and snapping it was kind of my way of just closing the chapter on this mistake um, and then moving forward with a different approach next time. Uh, I am going to do something about this. Uh, I don't want to ever get to this stage again on a beautiful blade and have a catastrophic failure uh, that can be prevented. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify my belt grinder so that I have a secondary flat platen here which I can remove as I, whenever I'm not working on an edge. And this will allow me to have this position that I'm more comfortable in, but I'll have the support that I normally only have down here. We'll see how that goes. I'm not gonna put that in this video. I may not put it in a video at all, or maybe I will, I really don't know. Um, what I will put in this video, however, is I'm gonna do another break test, because I broke it right here at the tang, which is the weakest spot. But I'm going to do a, a, a brake test. I'll probably have to use a sledgehammer to snap this thing. Definitely going to wear some face protection because this is dangerous. Um, I'll probably grind this edge down a little bit too because even though it's not a perfectly refined edge, it is sharp and I don't want a piece flying off and cutting me. So anyway, yeah, um, I'm sorry that this video ends this way. But um, we have learned something, at least I have. And even though I didn't get a beautiful blade out of it, I'm a better knife maker than I was yesterday. So let's uh, wrap this up with a little bit of a, a break test. Check out the grain stack structure. The grain structure looks really good um, from this position, but I want to check in a wider part here and I'll, I'll get a better close up, close up of that when I do it. Um, all right, let's move forward. Well, here's another development. That's not a really great looking grain structure. You really want this to be much more smooth and almost creamy. Um, those grits should be very ultra fine. And as you can see, it's a little too gritty here. We don't like that. Um, it probably would have still been a functional blade. I don't think there would have been any real issues with it, but, but I know we can do better. I've got a state of the art heat treat oven in the background to get really exacting heat treats, and I didn't use it for this. I used the Forge because I really was comfortable with going with color. Um, but that's something I definitely can learn from. And moving forward, I'll use the oven um, for the other half of this Damascus billet on the next knife that I make. And we'll get a better heat treat on that and a better hardened blade. So live and learn. All right, ladies and gentlemen, once again, you have my apologies. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to finish this series with a completed blade, but I learned a lot and hopefully you did too. If you wanna see what's coming up, please like and subscribe to the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments field and I'll definitely get back to you. All right, I'll see you next time.